Section 1 of The Rider on the White Horse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2013. The Rider on the White Horse by Theodor Storm. Translated by Margarete Münsterberg. Section 1 what I am about to tell I learned nearly half a century ago in the house of my great-grandmother, old Madame Feddersen, widow of the senator, while I was sitting beside her armchair, busy reading a magazine bound in blue pasteboard. I don't remember whether it was a copy of the Leipzig or of Pappes Hamburger Lesefrüchte. I still remember with a shudder how meanwhile the light hand of the past eighty-year-old woman glided tenderly over the hair of her great-grandson. She herself and her time are buried long ago. In vain have I searched for that magazine, and therefore I am even less able to vouch for the truth of the statements in it than I am to defend them if any one should question them but of so much I can assure any one that since that time they have never been forgotten, even though no outer incident has revived them in my memory. It was in the third decade of our century, on an October afternoon, thus began the storyteller of that time, that I rode through a mighty storm along a North Frisian dike. For over an hour I had on my left the dreary marshland, already deserted by all the cattle, on my right, unpleasantly near me, the swamping waters of the North Sea. I saw nothing, however, but the yellowish-grey waves that beat against the dike unceasingly, as if they were roaring with rage, and that now and then bespattered me and my horse with dirty foam. Behind them I could see only chaotic dusk which did not let me tell sky and earth apart, for even the half-moon which now stood in the sky was most of the time covered by wandering clouds. It was ice-cold, my clammy hands could scarcely hold the reins, and I did not wonder that the croaking and cackling crows and gulls were always letting themselves be swept inland by the storm. Nightfall had begun, and already I could no longer discern the hoof of my horse with any certainty. I had met no human soul, heard nothing but the screaming of the birds when they almost grazed me and my faithful mare with their long wings, and the raging of the wind and water. I cannot deny that now and then I wished that I were in safe quarters. It was the third day that this weather had lasted, and I had already allowed an especially dear relative to keep me longer than I should have done on his estate in one of the more northern districts. But today I could not stay longer. I had business in the city which was even now a few hours' ride to the south, and in spite of all the persuasions of my cousin and his kind wife, in spite of the Perinette and Grand Richard apples still to be tried, I had ridden away. "'Wait till you get to the sea,' he had called after me from his house-door. "'You will turn back. Your room shall be kept for you.' And really, for a moment, when a black layer of clouds spread pitch-darkness around me, and at the same time the howling squalls were trying to force me and my horse down from the dike, the thought shot through my head, "'Don't be a fool. Turn back and stay with your friends in their warm nest.' but then it occurred to me that the way back would be longer than the way to my destination, and so I trotted on, pulling the collar of my coat up over my ears. But now something came toward me upon the dike. I heard nothing, but when the half-moon shed its spare light, I believed that I could discern more and more clearly a dark figure, and soon, as it drew nearer, I saw that it sat on a horse, on a long-legged, haggard, white horse. A dark cloak was waving round its shoulders, and as it flew past me, two glowing eyes stared at me out of a pale face. Who was that? What did that man want? And now it came to my mind that I had not heard the beating of hoofs or any panting of the horse, and yet horse and rider had ridden close by me. Deep in thought over this I rode on, but I did not have much time to think, for straightway it flew past me again from behind. 
It seemed as if the flying cloak had grazed me, as if the apparition, just as it had done the first time, had rushed by me without a sound. Then I saw it farther and farther away from me, and suddenly it seemed as if a shadow were gliding down at the inland side of the dike. Somewhat hesitating, I rode on behind. When I had reached that place, hard by the koch, the land won from the sea by damming it in, I saw water gleam from a great veil, as they call the breaks made into the land by the storm floods, which remain as small but deep pools. In spite of the protecting dike, the water was remarkably calm, hence the rider could not have troubled it. Besides, I saw nothing more of him. Something else I saw now, however, which I greeted with pleasure. Before me, from out of the koch, a multitude of little scattered lights were glimmering up to me. They seemed to come from some of the rambling Frisian houses that lay isolated on more or less high mounds. But close in front of me, halfway up the inland side of the dike, lay a great house of this kind. On the south side, to the right of the house door, I saw all the windows illumined, and beyond I perceived people, and imagined that I could hear them in spite of the storm. My horse had of himself walked down to the road along the dike, which led me up to the door of the house. I could easily see that it was a tavern, for in front of the windows I spied the so-called ricks, beams resting on two posts with great iron rings for hitching the cattle and horses that stopped there. I tied my horse to one of these and left him to the servant who met me as I entered the hall. "'Is a meeting going on here?' I asked him, for now a noise of voices and clicking glasses rose clearly from the room beyond the door. "'Eh, hey, some of the sort!' the servant replied in Plattdeutsch, and later I learned that this dialect had been in full swing here, as well as the Frisian, for over a hundred years. The dikemaster and the overseers and the other landholders. That's on account of the high water. When I entered, I saw about a dozen men sitting round a table that extended beneath the windows. A punch-bowl stood upon it, and a particularly stately man seemed to dominate the party. I bowed and asked if I might sit down with them, a favour which was readily granted. "'You had better keep watch here,' I said, turning to this man. "'The weather outside is bad. There will be hard times for the dikes.' "'Surely,' he replied, "'but we here on the east side believe we are out of danger. Only over there on the other side it isn't safe. The dikes there are mostly made more after old patterns.' Our chief dike was made in the last century. We got chilly outside a while ago, and you, he added, probably had the same experience. But we have to hold out a few hours longer here. We have reliable people outside who report to us. And before I could give my order to the host, a steaming glass was pushed in front of me. I soon found out that my pleasant neighbor was the dike master, we entered into conversation, and I began to tell him about my strange encounter on the dike. He grew attentive, and I noticed suddenly that all talk round about was silenced. "'The rider on the white horse!' cried one of the company, and a movement of fright stirred the others. The dike master had risen. "'You don't need to be afraid,' he spoke across the table. That isn't meant for us only. In the year 17 it was meant for them too. May they be ready for the worst. Now a horror came over me. Pardon me, I said. What about this rider on the white horse? Apart from the others, behind the stove, a small, haggard man in a little, worn black coat sat somewhat bent over. One of his shoulders seemed a little deformed. He had not taken part with a single word in the conversation of the others, but his eyes, fringed as they were with dark lashes, although the scanty hair on his head was grey, showed clearly that he was not sitting there to sleep. Toward him the dikemaster pointed. "'Our schoolmaster,' he said, raising his voice, "'will be the one among us who can tell you that best. 
to be sure only in his way and not quite as accurately as my old housekeeper at home, Antje Folmans, would manage to tell it. You are joking, Dykemaster, the somewhat feeble voice of the schoolmaster rose from behind the stove, if you want to compare me to your silly dragon. Yes, that's all right, schoolmaster, replied the other, but stories of that kind are supposed to be kept safest with dragons. Indeed, said the little man, in this we are not quite of the same opinion, and a superior smile flitted over his delicate face. You see, the dikemaster whispered in my ear, he is still a little proud. In his youth he once studied theology, and it was only because of an unhappy courtship that he stayed hanging about his home as schoolmaster. The schoolmaster had meanwhile come forward from his corner by the stove, and had sat down beside me at the long table. Come on, tell the story, schoolmaster, cried some of the younger members of the party. Yes, indeed, said the old man, turning toward me. I will gladly oblige you, but there is a good deal of superstition mixed in with it, and it is quite a feat to tell the story without it. I must beg you not to leave the superstition out, I replied. You can trust me to sift the chaff from the wheat by myself. The old man looked at me with an appreciative smile. End of section 1